Okay, I just realized that my explanation of how the saw set works probably didn't make a lot of sense because, you know, I do these videos by myself. I don't have anyone to film for me usually. And uh, But anyway, I just wanted to show a little closer up if I can. This is looking down inside of the saw set. Um, again, filming with one hand. This side on, over here will be the anvil. This side will be the hammer or the plunger that comes out. And let's see if you can get... You see it comes together, squeezes the saw, and then that little inside piece pushes against the tooth. Now the top of the anvil, you can't really see it, uh, has a, an angle or a bevel to it that allows that hammer when it comes out to push the tooth over some. So anyway, and then I, uh, when it sits on the saw plate, it comes down uh, until until it sits on top of the saw plate. And when you squeeze it, it will come up and level itself out and be ready to push it to, which I'm not right now. But in just a second, we will. All right. Okay, let's go ahead and set the saw. Uh, I'll probably do like I did when I was sharpening. I'll start, turn the camera off, and then come back. But what I'm going to do is just start. This is the back of the saw plate. Uh, as I stated previously, this, the saw set is designed to set down on the top of the saw plate. But starting on the first few teeth, Obviously, it's going to hang over into nothing. All I'm going to do is just eyeball it, keep it level back here, and I'm going to catch every other tooth and give it just that little squeeze. Little squeeze. Doesn't take much, doesn't take long, especially on a saw this small with this fine a teeth, 16 teeth per inch. It's pretty small. Now I'm beginning to get on the saw plate with the other side, so I won't have to be as careful. Just bring it down. And I'll continue to do that until I reach the tip. And then I will turn it around, as you'll see me do, and push from the other side. I think that's enough for that. Okay, now I'm simply going to take the saw plate out and turn it around. And I, again, want to start from the back of the plate. You can start from either end, but just so that I don't forget, I'm going to start from the back of the plate. Uh, again, the uh, saw set kind of hangs over to start with. And I'm just going to start again on every other tooth. And again, like I said, it doesn't take much. This is a small saw. You don't want much set especially in a dovetail saw like this because it will make the saw wander in its own curve. And we want the saw to track a very tight line. And I will just continue that and then we'll pick up when I get through. Okay, as you can see, I've reassembled the saw, although the tote has not been refinished in any way. Uh, but I did it for the purpose of doing a little test. Uh, normally I would probably have the tote being refinished while I was working on the plate, but for this time, you know, life kind of got in the way. Uh, but you know, you can certainly do more than one thing at a time. Uh, the last step in preparing the tote here is uh, I'm gonna take this carborundum stone on the smooth side. It's one of these ones that has rough and uh, coarse and smooth. And I'm just gonna lightly run this, it's called stoning, down the outside of the plate here. Do that both ways. And all that did was if I have an errant tooth or, you know, a metal shaving or something sticking out, it kind of takes that off. And I'm not worried about reducing the set a whole lot because on a little dovetail saw like this, you don't want, as I mentioned before, you don't want a lot of set, you know, because it, it, it'll cut straighter. You want almost no set, really. And I'm gonna start on these front teeth that I, you know, uh, didn't give much rake to and see how it cuts. That's uh, 
really not very good pine. It's pretty poor, but uh, if it'll cut this, it'll cut any good hardwood. You can hear how it's kind of quiet up here on those teeth in the front. But when I get to the back, pretty aggressive. teeth in the front, they become, they get progressively more aggressive as you get to the back of the saw. I'm putting really no pressure. I'm actually sort of holding up on the saw a little bit. And that's about an inch deep, which, you know, I don't think I cut very many dovetails that deep at all. But, uh, you know, just another note, uh, the saw is sharp, cuts good. I probably wasn't, you know, uh, doing as good a job as I could while I'm talking. But as I sharpen this saw, it will actually get better. Because a lot of what I did this time was sort of reestablishing the teeth. I won't need to use the saw set every time. Uh, just whenever you start to feel the saw bind in the kerf, you will want to reset the, the, the teeth on it. And that's probably, I don't know, five, six, seven sharpenings before you have to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead now and uh, disassemble the saw and get started on uh, finishing the tote. So we'll be right back on that. All right, now to finish the tote, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a base coat of uh, just shellac, it could be painted on, I happen to have spray can, uh, you know, these are the brands that come from the local big box store. Doesn't matter what brand, it's, it'll all work if you buy a good product. Uh, and then I will go over the top of that. I like to use satin on the lacquer. Uh, it's a matter of personal preference. I don't really want my old tools looking like they're coated in shiny plastic. I just want them protected. So uh, anyway, that's so what we're going to do, and like I said, this is this, this tote is a piece of English beech, and the English beech is a little bit different from American beech. It's a little bit, I don't know, harder, maybe more stable. I'm not sure what the word is. Usually, not always, usually the English beech ends up having better grain than the American beech, especially the quarter sawn, which uh, most of the totes, whether it be on a, a plane or a saw or what have you, uh, they'll be quarter sawn. And this piece is quarter sawn. It just doesn't uh, show out as much as some of them. It doesn't have a lot of ray fleck. Uh, some people call it ray fleck. Some people call it flower, whatever you call it. Uh, this piece is not real showy, uh, but I like to put a coat of shellac down first. It seems to seal any impurities that the piece might have in and allows, it seems to allow the lacquer to go on top and grab and stay without any problems. Now, there's been some articles recently stating that it's not necessary to put shellac under another finish, but I was always taught and I have found and I still stand by the fact that shellac is your friend when it comes to finishing because you can put maybe a water-based stain, let it dry, come over it with shellac and then come over that with an oil-based finish and it will stay and not bleed through and that type of thing. So, uh, you know, I'll give this time to dry. Uh, it depends upon the humidity mostly. Uh, Today's actually 100% chance of rain outside, so the humidity even in my shop is pretty high. Might take a while, but follow the directions on the can. Let it dry. I may put a second coat of shellac. It just depends when I look at it. I want to see an even coat all the way around. And then I'll put three to five coats of lacquer on it. And so that's the process. Okay, I did the, I did the finger check a few times, and... I guess with the rain outside, we've been having rain almost all week, uh, it's just taking it a long time to dry. Now what I like to do is between any any of the coats, 
I like to take some four out steel wool and just lightly and politely uh, run over it and knock off any nibs, burrs. Technically, you don't have to do that between every coat, probably every two coats or so of the lacquer. But if you take the time and do it on every coat, you will almost certainly be assured of a very smooth coat. Uh, another thing I didn't mention is that shellac will always give you a gloss uh, finish, which you can you can always dull down any gloss finish with a little four out steel wool. Uh, but when I go over that with the satin lacquer, it will take off uh, that gloss and it won't be there anymore. So I'm going to use a little bit of steel wool, I'm sorry, a little bit of compressed air to uh, get rid of the steel wool filings. Sorry about the noise. And again, just a, especially at first, a light coat. And a little bit heavier coat as we go along. That's about it. It's uh, mostly a waiting game. Okay, well, here's the finished product. One coat of shellac, five coats of satin lacquer. Uh, you know, again, everybody thinks that you need gloss. You really don't. Uh, satin actually has enough gloss. It's really called luster. And the little spear in Jackson saw is ready to go to work. Uh, was it a museum restoration? Absolutely not. Uh, it was never intended to be. This saw is now restored and ready to go to work in this shop where I hope to get years and years of use out of it. Uh, you know, everything that I did was done with common tools, easily accessible tools. You know, a little tricorner file, about six, seven dollars down at the hardware store. Carver on the stone, screwdriver, bottle ball cans. Uh, the saw set's the only thing that you might not have, but if you look around in flea markets, you'll find them seven to 10 bucks in my area down here in the south. And uh, you can get some really good, good tools that way. Again, I used the joiner to flatten the teeth to get them all to the same level. But, you know, it's a luxury. I happen to have it. If, if I didn't have it, I would simply hold a, a file flat and square, take a couple of very light passes, and uh, I'd be done with that. So, a uh, little homemade saw chock because my saw vise didn't fit this small of a saw with the back on it. And uh, Anyway, that's it. Thanks for watching.